dig my grave If it's my to choose Feels like there's nothing left for me to lose I dig my grave How many times I've got to tell you I'm all caught up in bad advice So many times I've had to hear you say You know what you gotta do Dun, da, da, da. Share it out to your friends, everyone. Um, here's the FDA document. Okay, so you don't believe me here. I have it linked in this article for you so you can show all of your friends. This is done. Okay, I'm at the point now where people are starting to wake up and it's beginning to get easier for me to be bold. And sometimes I tell people they get angry. But why don't you talk about this? Why don't you talk about that? And I'll tell you the truth is sometimes people aren't ready to hear it. But now people are getting more vocal. Now I'm willing to share information a little more uh, unashamedly, a little more abrasively. Uh, here it is. FDA document linked in the article. What do they say on the PCR test? Detection of viral RNA may not indicate the presence of infectious virus or that 2019 NCOV is the causative agent for clinical symptoms. Wait, what? Does that mean the PCR test is basically garbage? Yeah, pretty much. It means that detection of viral RNA, meaning you could get positive tests, and it doesn't mean that you're infectious. That's the first thing it says. Or that it that SARS COVID, uh, like the SARS COVID 19, whatever you want to call it, but they're saying 2019 and COVID infection. They're saying they don't even know for sure from the PCR test that it is a causative agent for clinical symptoms. That means that the performance of this uh, test, and it says the performance of this test has not been established for monitoring treatment, but this is another one. The test cannot rule out diseases caused by other bacterial or viral pathogens. This will come up FDA, CDC 2019 novel coronavirus and COVID real time RT PCR diagnostic panel. You go down to page 39 or 40 rather, sorry, the beginning of page 40. Here we are. This is where we're getting this information from for everyone uh, listening in. This test cannot rule out diseases caused by other bacteria or viral pathogens. And there we go. It's saying it can pick up. Uh, it doesn't indicate that uh, COVID is the cause of the agent for clinical symptoms and that uh, viral RNA may not indicate the presence of infectious virus. So it could be picking up dead virus. It could be picking up other virus. It could be picking up completely unrelated things. And then we say it's COVID. And coincidentally, <laughs> where did the flu go? Coincidentally, the other experts have been pointing out around the world that numbers in other categories for deaths have dropped at the same time. COVID's gone up and they think the numbers coincide pretty closely. So on the PCR test, there's a German physician saying, listen, if you went to a hospital and you started testing people, you're going to find at any time in a hospital or, or uh, like a clinical care setting, you're going to find five to 14%, seven to 15%, somewhere in that range of people with coronaviruses. Then people go, well, the PCR test is problematic. I knew that. I knew that. But then it's not just that the PCR test is problematic. You add in what this physician saying, 7 to 15% in any clinical uh, hospital setting would probably be uh, cr have a coronavirus in them. Okay. And then the PCR test can pick up other bacteria and pathogens that aren't SARS-CoV-2. So you're basically testing with the thing amplifying it to stupid high levels so that it can pick up fragments so small so that something it could be it could be the flu you can literally be testing positive for the flu and it says it's uh, it's a pcr positive oh greg you're crazy no not at all and in fact on the top of my head i can't think of the article or medical article right now maybe my wife can find it but they tested 
Uh, people that tested positive for COVID, they ran thousands through to test them for influenza and found that uh, it was a massive amount of them actually had influenza. So we stopped, stopped testing altogether for influenza. We have a PCR test that according to the FDA, right? Again, not my words. This is the FDA. Dot gov. It's a media download. It's about the, you can look it up yourself. It's also linked in this uh, description below, but it's the novel coronavirus real-time PCR, RT-PCR diagnostic review. And they're talking and they're telling you it can pick up other things. Doesn't mean you're infectious. And then you learn what we know. Uh, as pointed out in the corman uh, drosten protocol, like Mr. Hillier points out, which I will now point from the letter itself. Uh, here we go. Sorry, Ron. This is from Mr. Hillier's letter um, linked in our article on DivergeMedia.ca. The world's predominant widely inaccurate PCR testing protocols are based on incomplete theoretical genome sequences supplied by China. Virologist Victor Corman and Christian Drosten led the exceptionally rapid creation of the first COVID-19 PCR test, the corman drosten protocol. It is now the most commonly used testing protocol in the world for detecting the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which may in certain cases lead to the disease COVID-19. As discussed, Infra, the Court of Appeal of Lisbon, concluded that this PC, uh, PCR test was producing as many as 97% false positives, specifically when you cycle it above 35. Corman, and we cycle up to 40 in Ontario, 45 in Quebec, 33 to 45 across Canada. You can find that in our article, PCR to, uh, uh, bombshell PCR test, um, widely shared article of ours under COVID related articles. You'll find it there. Okay. Corman and Drosten were provided with the in silico or theoretical genome sequences used to create their PCR protocol by Chinese scientists, including Yang Zheng Zhang and Xi, and Xi Seng Li, director at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. These genome sequences were then posted to the open source depository. This is in line with Dr. Um, Wolfgang's uh, version of events for the record too. And on January 10th, 2020, the Corman Drosten protocol was submitted to the WHO on January 13th, eight days prior to the day it was submitted to the medical journal. The WHO released the Corman Drosten protocol on January 21st, the same day it was submitted to Euro surveillance. So that's where that comes from. That's actually Mr. Haley's letter pointing that out. Uh, of all the 1,595 95 publications at Euro surveillance since 2015, not one other research paper was reviewed and accepted in fewer than 20 days, except this one, on PCR, except the one on the most important fundamental thing that has been holding us in lockdowns. This PCR test is the key. This is the fundamental tool that they've used to hype this thing because they can find things that aren't there. They're using crazy. Not only is it like a flawed test that doesn't have a, like their FDA is telling you, you can pick up other viruses. Not only that, they also amplify it way above the levels that are suggested by even other experts. Other doctors early on in the New York Post were saying 25 to 30 max. And Canada's like, hold my beer, 33 to 45, let's do it. <laughs> That's where we're at. So then we have Randy Hilly pointing that out in his letter that of almost 1600 publications since 2015, not one of their research papers in Euro surveillance was accepted in fewer than 20 days. And this one on the PCR Corman Drosten protocol set, uh, test for COVID, the whole thing that this whole thing hinges on, it was approved in eight days. None of them have been approved in 20 days since 2015 of 1600 articles. Almost this one gets approved in eight days. Coincidental. I don't know. I'll let you make up your mind on that. PCR test picks up fragments of other viruses. It can pick up things. Uh, and the way we amplify it, it it's per, just, it's going to, it's going to, with how high we amplify it, you're picking up other things. And I'm supposed to believe the flu just dropped off the face of the planet. No, you stop testing it like it didn't exist anymore. That's why it dropped off the face of the planet. If I said to you, so China locks down. We know now that the death rates have been drastically overinflated. We know that the PCR test is picking up other pathogens and they're counting those as COVID on and on the list goes. What would I say to you? If Italy, the person that are the country that legitimized lockdowns for the rest of democratic nations across the world had been experiencing excess deaths from the influenza or from influenza for 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. And this article was released in 2019. They had more excess deaths than the second world war. Not my words. Let's get into the medical study now and get it into some um, of the actual writing. Right. Here it is. 
in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases investigating the impact of influenza on excess mortality in all ages in Italy during recent seasons, 2013 and 2014 to 2016, 2017 seasons. Highlights. More than 68,000 deaths were attributable to, attributable to flu epidemics were estimated in that study period. Italy showed a higher influenza attributable excess mortality compared to other European countries, especially in the elderly. Okay, now we go to the results. We estimate excess deaths of 7,027, 20,259, 15,801, and 24,981 attributable to influenza epidemics in the 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016 respectively seasons using the Goldstein index. The average annual mortality excess rate per 100,000 ranged from 11.6 to 41.2, with most of the influenza-associated deaths per year registered among the elderly. However, children less than five years old reported a relevant influenza attributable excess death in 2014 and 2016 seasons, respectively. Conclusions. Over 68,000 deaths were attributable to influenza epidemics in the study period. The observed excess deaths is not completely unexpected given the high number of fragile, very old subjects living in Italy. This is in 2019 this was released. In recent years, Italy has been registering in death rates, particularly are, has been registering peaks in death rates, particularly among the elderly during the winter season. A mortality rate of 10.7 per 1,000 inhabitants was observed in the winter season 2014-2015, more than 375,000 deaths in absolute terms, corresponding to an estimated 54,000 excess deaths of 9.1% 9, 9 as compared to 2014. This representing the highest reported mortality rate since the Second World War in Italy. So, 2016, or sorry, uh, yes, 2016, I think it is. Highest reported excess mortality rate since the Second World War. And yet, not a mention of this when they talk about the excess deaths that happened in Italy. At the beginning of this. So if they're testing for the PCR in Italy, in the retirement homes, in the elder care homes, they're already having prior years. Now, this doesn't mean that in 18, 19, and, uh, and, and 2020 that that epidemic maintained itself and continued. But that's just to say there was a history there and what it could have came back. And if it was true because there was an elderly and frail population there, could it be that they had worse results and we were using worse results PCR to, and they just did everything they could boost the fear out of Italy and it legitimized everything across the world. That is what I think happened. I can, I, you know, I'm going to pull up one more here on the any jam on masking, any jam talisman masking. So all of this has been on based on the PCR test was, which is based on that Corman Drosten protocol, which is riddled with issues. No, none of the Euro surveillance is 1600 publications roughly from 2015 to today have been approved in less than 20 days. This one that every PCR test is basically based on, that the entire pandemic basically hinges on, it gets approval in less than eight days. And by the way, the guy who created the test sits on the board at the place that approved it, that peer reviewed it. We have Texas, we have Mississippi last I heard is uh, mask free. Listen, the mask is another one. I've talked about this so many times. The Ontario Nursing Association is not going to talk. It, like, listen, they blew the healthcare budget on vaccines that may or may not be needed. They never even once looked into drugs. They could have looked into ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, any number of other uh, drugs to treat it first. And they didn't do that. They blew the budget on vaccines. And now what are they going to do? You have less money for healthcare as a result. If I am the ONA, I'm not going to speak out against the government too much. I'm going to just try not to get my nurses' jobs cut. And nobody's thinking that nurses' jobs are going to get cut in the middle of a pandemic, but you are when you understand we don't really have the money to bankroll all of this. And they just billions and billions out the door for vaccines, and it may not have been the best approach. The ONA in 2015, Ontario Nursing Association, 2015, 2018, they went to court and fought and won against mandatory masking, VOM policy, vaccine or mask at St. Michael's Hospital for uh, nurses that refused the influenza vaccine. They said, listen, I'm not going to do that. There's no proof it's effective um, in reducing patient or uh, uh, nurse 
transmission. And they won in court 2015 and 2018. The arbitrator said there wasn't sufficient proof that it protected the nurse or the patient. So that got tossed out. But if I'm them, I'm not going to speak out on this. So we got an Ontario nursing association with a court precedent that's not going to speak out against mandatory masking. And the masking ask is acting as a fear mechanism that just reiterates our draconian, stupid, idiotic approach to dealing with COVID. Hey, let's destroy our future because we could save a couple thousand lives, but we'll destroy millions later, but let's save a couple thousand today. Even if that were true, the utter stupidity of it, you're throwing out the future. It's like, oh, let's throw out the future. I could save a couple thousand today. Might kill millions tomorrow, which is way more than we or we're going to save, but like, whoa, we can save a couple thousand today and I can be the hero. That's what politicians are doing today. And they're doing it with a PCR test that has been just bullet holed by experts all over the world for a year. And it's not known to be reliable. Anything over 35, less than 3% chance you're actually infectious. Check out another study if you're new to Diverge Media. I don't know who's in the chat room. Wuhan, roughly 10 million residents tested with the PCR test. Roughly three or 300 were asymptomatic PCR positives. Of those 300 asymptomatic PCR positives, zero were actually infectious. Zero were actually viable viruses, meaning able to grow. Why are we wearing masks as asymptomatic people? 10 million people tested, 300 asymptomatic, zero actually infectious. Get rid of the freaking mask. And you're never talking about the long-term consequences of these actions. What about the effects on uh, the psychology of the adult population and how they interact with each other? What about the effects on children and how they interact with each other? What about the fact that now there might be trust issues? There might be uh, like I was talking with a woman who had a son in high school, and it's like he's not the type to yell. Oh, I'm not going to be the type, to, and you have to be like that with a mask on. So if I'm a kid that's maybe a little more socially quiet, keep to myself, I'm probably going to have an even harder time getting to know people now at school. And I'm going to be even more concerned about what they think because I can't see the micro expressions on their face and all these things. Did we factor in any of that? No. And what did you want to know what the, the medical articles were saying about this? Sorry, everyone. What were the medical articles saying about this when this all kicked off? Well, I'll show you. Because it, again, it, it, you, you can think I'm out the launch. I really don't care anymore. But universal masking in hospitals in the COVID-19 era. Now they say, well, this is because there was a shortage. So we lied in medical literature because there was a shortage. We had to lie to you. No, that's not true. Okay. May 21st, 2020, this was released early on. And I'm going to go here. It is also clear that masks serve symbolic roles. Masks are not only tools, they are talismans that may increase healthcare workers' perceived sense of safety, well-being, and trust in their hospitals. Although such reactions may not be strictly logical, we are all subject to fear and anxiety, especially during times of crisis. One might argue that fear and anxiety are better countered with data and education than with a marginally beneficial mask particularly in light of a worldwide mask shortage, but it is difficult to get clinicians to hear this message in the heat of the current crisis. Well, we just lied because there was a mask shortage. No, they're saying it was, uh, it, it's basically, it's a talisman uh, for anxiety and fear and that it may give a perceived sense of safety, but that one might argue that fear and anxiety are better countered with data and education. That's what they said. So now we got that. Well, the mask is keeping the fear up. We got a PCR test that's amplified to ungodly levels, 33 to 45 across Canada. Uh, increase, oh, and by the way, FDA document says it can pick up other bacteria, other pathogens. It doesn't mean that if you test positive, you're infectious or that the virus you even tested for was COVID-19. says that right in the FDA document. But don't worry, you'll find a fact-checked article somewhere from Snopes that probably says that article or that document's out the lunch. And then they'll take some conspiracy theorist who took it out of context and spun it the wrong way. And they'll take his quote and they'll say, that's what you're all saying. Yes, but go read it yourself. And when you think about the Great Reset, every single thing that's being done right now, they're talking about, oh, you know, no new normal. And this is a great opportunity to build back better. And I just wrote an article the other day. Trudeau was at she, um, she 2021 talking about gender equality. And he was asked, um, do you think this is like never waste a good crisis, Justin, when speaking about gender equality and we can build back better and all this crap? Do you think this is like never, never waste a good crisis, Justin? And he goes, I think so. There's your prime minute. Like that should be front page flipping news. CBC, CTV, Global, Rebel, Post Milan. The PM just admitted he thinks he should never waste a good crisis. He's telling you he's going to push through his agenda because COVID. He thinks that's oh, a great opportunity. Like 
the guy literally called it an opportunity in his question to Trudeau. And he says, I think so. Like we in two months and six days did our entire traffic of last year, this year, people are paying attention. People are starting to wake up. People are sharing good information and uh, just seeing the growth explode. Like people are waking up. They are listening, but we need to find a way to bring this information out in a way that's palatable. And that's where I'm working harder and harder all the time to do that. Because uh, as we discovered, I uh, reported on Dr. Eileen Davila's husband um, has spoke at CV Update 2020. It's a cardiovascular event where he disclosed uh, financial relationships. Yeah, it says relationships with financial interests, research support. He received research support. This is the medical officer of Toronto's husband has received research support from AstraZeneca and Bayer. And he uh, received speakers, bureau, honoraria, and consulting fees from AstraZeneca, Bayer, Boehringer, Ingelheim, Lilly, BMS, Pfizer, HLS, Novartis, Sanofi, and Servier. So somebody like at, at, like that has at, you know financial relationships and has access to somebody who's locking down an entire city when they don't have to right now, right? They were told they can come out of gray lockdown zone or whatever and and go in the red, and they're like, nah, let's keep it in. That's what they did. And then you find out her husband in June of 2020 uh, spoke at CV Update 2020 and disclosed financial intra or financial relationships with Bayer, Pfizer, AstraZeneca. It's like, yeah, I, don't the, I don't know if it's conflict of interest, but the optics look terrible. And that's the thing that I, that needs to be pushed for more than anything out of this is we start need, we need to start pushing for accountability. We need to start pushing for full disclosure, financial interest, all these things. Like, what the hell's going on with Dr. Eileen Davila? Her husband has disclosed relationship uh, financial relationships with Bayer, AstraZeneca. Like, so I need the public should know what's in those disclosures. That shouldn't be disclosed inf or uh, um, closed information to the public. We should know. So, if you like what you heard today, make sure to share it out. Thank you. I'm Greg Staley signing out.